Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to SLIS 752, uh, Diversity in Libraries. I'm Nicole Cook. I'm the instructor for the class. And thank you for joining us today as we begin the Augusta Baker Diversity Lecture Series. And so this series is designed to chat with practitioners and experts in the field who deal with an aspect of diversity in their LIS practice. So today we begin our series with JJ Pianchi. JJ is the Applied Health Sciences Librarian at the University of Illinois uh, and quite the expert when it comes to disabilities and accessibility in library and information science. So I can't think of a better way to kick off the series with JJ. So JJ, thank you so much for joining us today and I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, and just a note to uh, students and attendees, uh, we are keeping all of our fingers and toes crossed with GoToMeeting. So if there are any hiccups or um, things that happen, uh, just bear with us and we'll get back to uh, normal as soon as we can uh, work out a few more of these kinks. So in the meantime, uh, while things are currently working, uh, JJ, take it away. Alrighty, I presume that you can all actually hear me. Yes. Um, <clears throat> that's good. Okay, let's try doing this and see if it actually works again, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Look at it, it's a miracle. It's a miracle for at least five minutes. Um, we'll see how this goes. So, okay, my name is JJ Pianchi. I'm the Applied Health Sciences Librarian at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about accessibility um, in librarianship or accessibility. This is the way um, I may or may not have like completely mainlined The Mandalorian recently, and I'm all like, baby Yoda! Um, so yeah, don't judge me. Okay, so the first half of this presentation is pretty um, audience participation-y. That's a word now. So I want you to light up my chat box. Um, who do we see on the screen before us? Anybody recognize any of these people? Yep, we've got Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So Giles. We've got the original Ghostbusters librarian. She's on the top. Excellent job, Benjamin. Um, yes, that is the librarian from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So when we look at all three of these pictures, what do we notice about these librarians? They're old, yep. See a lot of gray hair. They're white, I see old white people, right? <clears throat> what else do we notice about them? Very conservative um, and dapper. <laughs> so yes, but very conservative. They're very dressed up, right? Which is kind of antithetical to how I think most librarians, at least working in public libraries, tend to work today. Um, in terms of like being more dressed down, t-shirt, cardigan, slacks, things like that. Um, what do you notice about the backgrounds behind our librarians here? Lots and lots of books. We've got high shelves, we've got a lot of books, um, probably a lot of books that we can't reach. Uh, things like that. If you look at Ghostbuster Librarian, um, when you look at the background around her, you know, you're seeing a lot of wood, you're seeing chairs with arms. Um, if I was in a wheelchair and, and if I could even get into this room, um, the only place for me to go is to stick out into the aisle at the end of a table, right? So what we have here is a lot of stereotyping. Now, when we see these kinds of stereotypes, how do you think that affects someone who's a minority, especially someone who has a disability?
definitely presents a barrier, right? A pretty huge barrier because I'm not seeing myself represented, right? Exactly, Dylan. Um, there's a lack of representation, right? So I'm looking at these people and going, they don't look like me. They probably don't sound like me. Um, you know, it's really overwhelming. Um, I don't want to ask them any questions because they'll think I'm stupid. Um, you know, especially because of my speech impediment or because, you know, I don't have use of my arms or, um, you know, whatever. Right. So unfortunately, this is sort of the Hollywood representation of what Hollywood thinks or what the media thinks librarians are. Now, this is a little dated. Um, I, I need to do some homework on finding, quote unquote, current representations of librarians. Um, I'm not up into uh, watching lots of media, uh, mostly because I'm on the tenure track, which kind of consumes your life um, in so many ways. So I don't really watch any TV, but <sighs> I'm not sure that the representations of librarians in today's television or movies has maybe changed all that drastically. Um, so it's something to think about is like, what, how are we presenting ourselves to the public? Um, especially because the public sees Giles and Ghostbusters and Indiana Jones librarians as being like who we are, right? <clears throat> So ultimately, you know, the question then becomes is, what is disability? Um, what do we have represented here? Chat it out. We've got color blindness in the right hand corner. Mobility impairment signified by the wheelchair on the left. LGBT close, but it is actually representing a certain disability. So Dylan is saying exclusion. I presume you're talking about the four people together and the one person away from them. Um, the four, I like using the, the four people together and the one person away to represent like mental health disabilities, like depression, um, anxiety, things like that, because it's so, ex it's so exclusionary, um, or the feelings that come with those disabilities are very exclusionary. The infinity symbol is actually a symbol for autism. Um, the autism community, there's a lot of controversy around autism speaks, um, especially around the idea of the puzzle piece. Um, so quite a few people with autism say things like, I'm not a puzzle to be solved. You know, I just am who I am. Um, if you dive into the statistics of people with, with autism, they have a much higher rate of being some flavor of queer, um, some usually also some flavor of transgender. Uh, so the autism community tends to be um, much different uh, in terms of quote unquote, the traditional puzzle piece. Um, and so that's why I actually, I used to have the puzzle piece there um, and removed it and instead used the infinity symbol, uh, the rainbow infinity symbol, as it's a recognized symbol um, <clears throat> for the autism community that the autism community itself uses, um, which is important. Okay, so why do you think we might need laws about disability rights? Um, you know, this this seem this, you know, might seem like a no brainer, but why do you think we need these laws like the American with Disabilities Act, et cetera? Um, to protect against discrimination, right? Just like any of my other minority, unfortunately, the majority tends to take advantage of people with disabilities. And that, you know, is still even a very recent thing, right? Deviant and disabled people were forcefully sterilized in a eugenics program in North Carolina until 1978. That was 42 years ago. I was born in 1978. Um, so, you know, that's, it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, one of the things that people don't realize or they forget um, is that 
you know, the Holocaust started not with Hitler going after Jews. The Holocaust started with Hitler going after people with disabilities because he figured if 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 Germans were willing to euthanize their own people um, because they were different from them, from quote unquote regular people, then it wouldn't be that far of a stretch to euthanize other peoples that were really different from Germans. Um, and it's kind of horrifying. So unfortunately, when you look at sort of what this current administration, federal administration is doing, um, you know, the current federal administration is unfortunately going in the same direction with the repeal uh, and, and not the repeal, well, with the repeal as well as making it far more difficult for people to get on disability and stay on disability. Um, there's already been plenty of cases of people with disabilities who've been kicked off of um, you know, disability insurance and things like that to the point where they've died. Um, and that's all recent, right? That's all part of the current federal administration. So why do we need laws about disability rights? Because if there aren't any, and we have a minority population that you know may have problems and often does have problems fighting for its rights um, because of the medical conditions that they have, then you know the majority is going to squash them, um, which is why we need disability rights laws. Um, so the American with Disabilities Act uh, came out in 1990. Um, I like this. It's this is this quote is not from the act itself, but it um, nicely summarizes what is in the act. And um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people think that ADA really focuses only on physical disabilities, and that is not true. Um, ADA focuses on a wide variety of disabilities, including psycho uh, psychological disorders. Um, temporary disabilities, you fall, you break your leg, you're in a cast, you're covered under the ADA, um, as well as learning disabilities, um, neurological issues, things like that. And I mean, that's all covered under ADA. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, one of the lesser discussed areas, uh, I think, in librarianship is talking about mental health. And um, this is sort of by the numbers or some numbers about um, mental health. So basically one in five adults or 19% will have some kind of mental disorder um, of some kind in a given year. Um, and about 60% will have a mental disorder within their lifetime. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people, right? So when you look at the little handy dandy chart here, um, or table, I should say. What what sticks out to you in this table? Anxiety disorders is pretty high. It's almost twenty percent. Um, we know that that number is rising. Anxiety disorders also encapsulates a wide range of disorders, um, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, a lot of uh, students have anxiety, um, so anxiety is high. Anxiety and depression do feed into each other, though major depressive disorder I think refers much more to like severe depression, um, can't get out of bed, things like that, um, as well as like the more severe forms of like bipolar, uh, et cetera. What else sticks out to you on this table? So I'm going to draw your attention to schizophrenia. Um, schizophrenia is only half a percent, right? However, 
again, when we think about media representation, schizophrenics are vastly overrepresented in the media, and they're often represented as being violent, um, which is not usually the case, actually. Schizophrenics tend to actually self-segregate um, away from humans um, because, you know, they understand that how they're interacting with the world is different than how the rest of humanity interacts with the world. So they tend to actually be not violent, um, and they also tend to try to stay away from people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, computer, stop. Uh, so, um, so yeah, schizophrenia is actually really low in terms of the rate of, of occurrence, um, but in the media, it's usually represented much more often, right? How many, order, how many um, episodes of Law and Order in all of its permutations have, you know, highlighted some kind of person with schizophrenia, you know, being violent or whatever, um, or police procedural type of thing. So it's something to really think about. Um, what is the average time between onset of a mental disorder and getting assistance for that mental disorder? Any wild guesses? We've got a guess for two years, a couple years, um, depending on condition type, five years. <clears throat> the one to three years. Okay, so I would say that you are all lowballing it. The average time is 10 years. So it's about 10 years from onset of symptoms to actually getting assistance for those symptoms. Why do you think there's that big of a gap? And it's a pretty big gap. Some of it's social stigma, absolutely. Not noticing, that's actually pretty spot on. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, lack of health coverage, that's a huge one before the Affordable Care Act. Insurance companies limited you to 10 sessions a year. Okay, so if you're someone like me who sees a therapist every week, well, that's 52 sessions a year. Um, so yeah, it was really hard to actually get mental health assistance unless you were independently wealthy. Um, some of it's lack of education, stigma, social stigma around getting mental health um, assistance, et cetera. Um, but I want to return to uh, what somebody said earlier about um, not noticing. And that's very true. So if you take the sort of parable of the frog, right? You throw a frog in a bucket of hot water. What does the frog do? It jumps out. Right, exactly, Benjamin. It, bu it jumps out of the hot bucket of, or a hot pot of water. But if you throw the frog into a cold pot of water, and you turn the heat on underneath it, it will stay into that pot of water until it dies. And it's because that frog is making small incremental adjustments until it has adjusted so far that it can no longer live in that environment and therefore dies. And that is also true of mental health, right? Mental health isn't just like you wake up one morning, most of, let me rephrase that, most of mental health isn't you just wake up one morning and now you're schizophrenic or now you have major depression. It's a very slow, usually a very slow change over time um, and how it affects you. So in my own case, it was about 25 years between sort of onset of symptoms and then actually getting assistance. And that, that length of time was largely because I kept on making adjustments. Right. And it wasn't until I finally started getting assistance. I started getting assistance because of, quote unquote, a life crisis. And when I started actually getting therapy, I started to understand that my worldview was incredibly different than like everybody's around me. Right. Because I had just been making these small little incremental changes over time to the point where I was so far from center 
that I didn't understand how far from center I really was. So that's why there can be such a huge gap um, in terms of, you know, going and actually getting assistance. That's partially why there is a 10 year gap um, as well as other reasons, social stigma, um, you know, how much it costs being able to find someone in your area that can help you with, with whatever issues you have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna be more luxury here for a little while, um, so bear with me. Um, so this graph shows the frequency in which current library employees perform activities related to accessibility and disability. The data in this graph was collected in fall 2018 via snowball sampling uh, with social media and various listservs. The article on this survey has been published um, in the Journal of Library Administration as of last month. What's important in this somewhat overwhelming graph is that nearly all the activities listed, troubleshooting assistive technology, updating or creating websites to be accessible, updating or creating libguides or research guides to be accessible, writing policies to be more inclusive, reviewing policies to be more inclusive, taking continuing education about accessibility and disability, empathy training to improve patient interaction, etiquette and working with patients with disabilities, knowledge of basic sign language and empowered decision-making were marked by participants as happening either rarely or once or twice a year. The single holdout, which had a much more even distribution across the scale, was empowered decision-making. That said, updating or creating websites or libguides to be more accessible were also marked as happening a little more frequently than rarely or once or twice a year. The fact that respondents mark these activities as happening so rarely can indicate two possible things. One, people with disabilities rarely come into the library. This is highly unlikely. Two, um, that libraries don't see people with disabilities and are therefore not adequately serving this population. This is far more likely. Where the research gets interesting is the comfort level in performing the activities that I just listed. When we look at where's the most moderate comfort to no comfort at all, the range opens up significantly. The most uncomfortable activity is troubleshooting assistive technology software. Other areas of moderate or less comfort are updating websites or libguides to be accessible, writing and reviewing policies for inclusivity and knowledge of basic sign language. This indicates that while some of these activities are rarely performed, like troubleshooting assistive technology, library employees are generally not comfortable performing these activities in part because they probably haven't received training in anything related to accessibility or disability. The more discomfort a person has around an activity, the less likely they are to do it. Many libraries ignore accessibility and disability issues by resting on the idea of being American with Disabilities Act compliant. I contend, however, that being compliant, which means bare minimum, is nothing libraries should be proud of, especially because compliance with the law does not actually equal accessibility. These, excuse me, these two graphs show that there's a deficit in how often current library employees perform activities re related to accessibility and disability, as well as a lack of comfort in doing these activities. The question then becomes, are current library employees learning about disability and accessibility when they are completing their library science degrees? Spoiler alert, the answer is not really. In a similar survey to the library employee survey that I just discussed, library graduate students were surveyed in fall 2018 using snowball sampling through social media and listservs. The article on this survey will come out in 2020 in the Journal of Education in Library and Information Sciences. This chart shows that 59% of respondents indicated that they were not well at all or slightly well prepared to assist patrons with disabilities. Only 2% indicated that they were extremely well prepared. Considering that librarianship is a service profession that works closely and deeply with the public, the fact that over half of library graduate students don't feel prepared to assist patients with disabilities is disturbing. On the other hand, 46% of library graduate students indicated that they were not well at all or slightly well prepared to address accessibility issues. 4% indicated that they were extremely well prepared to address accessibility issues. While the survey did not delve into what accessibility issues might look like, there's a fairly significant focus in many library programs on the accessibility of electronic resources over other types of accessibility. Both current library employees and library graduate students feel that the importance of activities related to accessibility and disability are going to go up. Uh, my research shows that both groups are generally uncomfortable and unprepared 
to work on issues related to accessibility and disability. I'm currently writing a secondary analysis of both surveys to discuss my findings on a continuum from library graduate school through being employed in a library. So this article, when I finish it, will be submitted to Portal. Um, so what does this research mean in real life? Well, generally speaking, as long as universities have been able to remediate access um, in some way in a relatively appropriate amount of time, notice how this wording is vague and open to interpretation. Um, the legal system has generally sided with institutions. However, a court ruling in 2019, Payan versus the Los Angeles Community College District, has sent a shockwave through higher education, largely because the wording of the judgment states that, number two, within one year of the date of this order, LACCD shall evaluate LACC's integrated library system website and all library databases available to students enrolled at LACC to determine whether the library resources are fully accessible to blind students. LACCD shall either A, discontinue the use of any inaccessible library databases, inaccessible documents contained in library databases, or other inaccessible library resources available to students enrolled at LACC, or B, establish alternative means of providing access to the equivalent benefits of the inaccessible library resources to blind students in a timely manner, i.e. prior to or at the same time as sighted students are provided access to those library resources, including outside of the classroom. The most significant part of this judgment for libraries is that last sentence, because up until now, as long as institutions eventually provided remediated access to whatever the student needed, institutions were adhering to the law. Providing remediated access at the point of need rather than on the delay signifies an important shift in the courts and could open up institutions to negative legal judgments in the not so distant future. So how bad is the accessibility of databases that libraries purchase? The answer is really bad. Um, this is a screenshot of the landing page for Academic Search Ultimate at UAUC. The Big Ten Academic Alliance eResources Accessibility Task Force evaluated EBSCO's eBook platform, but luckily for us, the platform is generally the same across their products. When the test was conducted in April 2017, the biggest issues that DQ, the testing company, found was trouble navigating via keyboard only. Keyboard only users would have trouble with wayfinding. The and NVDA, an open source screen reader for Windows, had trouble navigating the site in general. If you dig deeper into the report, you'll see that other issues like lack of high contrast, headings are incorrect, text labels are missing, and the list goes on. The number one issue that the testing process has found across about 50 platforms between 2017 and today is that PDFs aren't accessible. The issues have ranged from the PDFs being scanned images to poor optical character recognition, or OCR, to no structural information or tagging, to no alternative text for images. Any of these problems make PDFs tediously accessible at best and inaccessible at worst to anyone using any kind of screen reader. So what can libraries do about accessibility? Consortia allow many libraries to come together, pull resources, share ideas, and potentially workload. Utilizing the power of the many also allows us to not only get better deals on the products that we buy from library vendors, but it also allows us to negotiate for better terms. The Big Ten Academic Alliance eResources Task Force, which I just talked about a little bit, was formed at the end of 2016 and has just recently taken on the Association for Southeastern Research Libraries. Together, these two consortia have formed the Library Accessibility Alliance. The initial goal of the alliance is to continue the e-resource testing that we've been doing since 2017. That said, Big Ten library directors have indicated that now that we're teaming up with other consortia, we need to think about branching out into other aspects of accessibility. Those branching out discussions are currently occurring. While the new group works on what our future direction will be, the leader of the old group, Heidi Schroeder and I, came together to write an article for Serial's review about the work of the task force from its inception through the creation of the Library Accessibility Alliance. The article will be out at the end of the year. As a member of the board for the new group, I am also on a subcommittee that has been tasked with measuring the impact of the work that the task force has done. We're in the early planning stages, but we'll probably do a combination of survey of member institutions, as well as textual analysis of accessibility reports. All of the accessibility reports are freely available to the public. 
My service work, which is usually related to my research, doesn't stop with the Alliance, however. I'm also a very active member in the Medical Library Association. So let's talk about organizations. With our library organizations, there's a fundamental, fundamental shift in how we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This shift hasn't been without missteps. We don't have to look any further than the racist incidents at ALA Midwinter in 2019 to see that our organizations still have a lot of growing to do. Our organizations are growing, however. I'm more familiar and engaged with Medical Library Association because of my current role as Applied Health Sciences Librarian, so that's what I'm going to talk about. As a member of MLA and as a person who hits multiple ticky boxes for diversity, including being transmasculine and disabled, I was tapped to sit on both the diversity task force and the annual meeting task force. On both of these task forces, I'm the loudest voice for accessibility. One of my key contributions to both task forces has been my experience with surveys and survey analysis. Knowing who membership is and what their opinions are of how the organization is changing is vitally important, which is why in the fall of 2019, the MLA Diversity Task Force surveyed the membership to see how they felt about the organization, about how the organization was doing with diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, as well as to get a better, better measure of what the demographic makeup of the organization is. 918 people responded to the survey. I'm currently writing the analysis report of the survey, but I want to pull out this particular graph. The question asked for the data from this graph was, please indicate if any of the following conditions currently limit your participation in MLA, and the options listed were deafness or difficulty of hearing, blindness or difficulty seeing even with glasses contacts, anxiety in certain situations or groups, difficulty walking or climbing stairs, difficulty standing for long periods of time, difficulty traveling, attending functions or doing errands alone, and difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. While the vast majority of people marked not applicable, I want you to take a look at the numbers and tell me your first reaction to what you see. Anybody? I'd say I can hear you breathing, but I can't. Anxiety is actually really high, right? So sometimes in some situations is marked at 209 people, rarely or seldom is 163, frequently very often is 44, always is five. So anxiety stands out as the highest level um, or the, yeah, the highest level, but there's issues across all of them, right? So, while well, rarely or seldom was usually the largest category for each condition, the fact that people even marked it indicates that there are far more people with disabilities in the profession than anyone has previously thought. I would point out that this question was not limited to single answer so that the data would reflect people with multiple conditions which if you have one disability, you usually have more than one. This is groundbreaking research in the profession because the profession has not generally focused on our own people in terms of disability or conditions that we have. For comparative purposes in 2017, the American Library Association did a membership survey. And of the members that answered the survey, only 2.91% indicated that they have a disability. According to the World Health Organization, 15% of the global population has a disability. And according to the US Census, about 19% of the US population has a disability. The ALA data indicates that either there are very few library employees with disabilities, which is highly unlikely, or that the profession is so toxic to people with disabilities that they are afraid to disclose, which is far more likely. The work of organizations is not only to help us be better librarians, for patrons, but also to be better employees. The work of MLA with the survey data that I just shared indicates that there's a serious disconnect within librarianship and how we perceive ourselves. Luckily, organizations like MLA are starting to understand this disconnect and are making efforts to make changes. This data will be published as an MLA Connect preprint next week with a white paper in the Journal of the Medical Library Association coming out this summer. 
Um, so that is my presentation. Um, I have, I'm paying the cat tax, right? I've got Aiden on the left, who's actually sitting at my left hip right now. And that's Savile on the right. Um, Savile's belly is indeed a trap, so be careful. And I am happy to answer questions. All right, thank you so much, JJ. Mm -hmm. Are there questions on what we just learned? Questions about accessibility, disability, questions about my research, questions about the CACs, who, let's face it, are the stars of the show. So, JJ, while folks are thinking, can you um, just kind of give us a little um, kind of uh, little nutshell about you, you also have done work with veterans and uh, things of that nature. You've done some really excellent displays. Can you talk a little bit about that? And we will come, we will then segue right back to the questions that are starting to come in. Sure. Um, so in my actual job, you know, what I do for, for an actual living, um, as the Applied Health Sciences Librarian, the Veteran Center is also connected um, to the Applied Health Sciences. Why it's connected to the Applied Health Sciences, I'm not entirely sure, but it is. So I support the Veteran Center quite a bit, and um, every November for Veterans Day, I do a very substantial exhibit um, in the North-South Hallway and Main Library here at UIUC. It's a very substantial space. Um, usually the printing costs for the exhibit are about $600. <laughs> I also have um, six display cases uh, to fill with stuff. So it's a lot. Um, and I've done a whole series of uh, displays about various topics. So I did a display about um, veterans and their service-related tattoos. Um, I interviewed 25 veterans um, for stories of service exhibit um, using the Library of Congress protocol. Um, that one in particular, I also added a question set about libraries and reading um, and wrote a paper about it that came out in Reference and User Services Quarterly last year. Um, so I've done a lot of exhibit work. Uh, I've also done a lot of writing around um, veterans and stuff like that. There is a um, librarian down at College Station in Texas uh, who got an IMLS grant uh, to do like veteran focused outreach and things like that. Um, and I'll be doing a, a session on creating um, veteran inspired library exhibits down there actually. Um, and that's in June, uh, so it's actually going to be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I do actually quite a, quite a bit of work with veterans. Um, and, you know, I do the exhibits, but I also do uh, collection development and things like that and reaching out to them and what are their needs um, to make sure they're getting all their needs met. So they're kind of like a secondary research area for me. My main area of research is definitely on um, accessibility and disability. And as a population that often has disabilities, many of them hidden, um, you know, they, it, it works very well with my primary um, research focus. Mm -hmm. So, All but right. I bet we have questions. Yes, uh, thank you. Let's see. Yeah. So I think uh, Molly had the first question. Are there things that your library is doing to combat these issues? specifically? Well, <laughs> it depends on which issue you're talking about. Um, since I've gotten here, I've spent a chunk of time campaigning for changes in our physical environment. Um, the Unfortunately, the library that the building that I'm in dates from the 1920s. So it's not the most accessible building that ever existed. Um, but I've been able to get quite a few changes. So we needed to have a ramp report. Um, we needed better signage and wayfinding signage, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. I've also 
been able to integrate into our training for our graduate students who work in the main library. Um, so every fall I do a disability accessibility training um, to get students started or get our graduate students starting to think about how do we interact with people with disabilities, um, you know, and start seeing people with disabilities. So I'm doing some of that kind of work. Um, a future project, which hopefully is not too far away, is to develop actually an intervention um, or training uh, around emotional intelligence to um, develop emotional intelligence in library employees so that we're working with people with disabilities in a more em empathetic and compassionate way rather than, you know, in ways that maybe are suspicious or abrupt or uninformed. Um, so that's some of the stuff that I've been doing, at least in terms of actual like outcomes rather than typical research. Great, thank you. And I think it's fair to say, just so Molly and all know, um, that a lot of the work that JJ does at, is at JJ's own initiative, right? So it's not that, you know, the mm -hmm. library administration are saying, you know, oh, what's, what's, you know, what can we do better? What can we fix? Like uh, in a lot of cases, this is JJ knocking on doors saying, it's me again. <laughs> um, and and we, we need to take care of this, right? So, you know, this is this goes along with um, some previous discussions about, you know, this work can be hard. Uh, this work takes uh, mm -hmm. effort and consistency. It's, it's, it's hard work. Um, and it's a lot about us being proactive, right? That, you know, mm -hmm. that, that saying, if you see something, say something, this is actually about us saying something, right? Because if, you know, folks can get away with it, uh, they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and JJ, I think it was an example that I heard from you uh, during one of your talks um, that there was a library director saying that they either didn't have to get a ramp or they didn't have to get an elevator because n no one with a physical impairment ever came into their library. Mm -hmm. And it was well, like, that, yeah, that was yeah. actually a quote from a mm -hmm. unpublished dissertation, master's thesis. Okay, um, right. And it, right. it was like, it was a library director saying, I paid ten thousand dollars for this elevator, and it's being used by like three people. Okay. Okay. And so, like you know, here you have this library director who's like completely missing the point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, that completely missing the point part, you know, what Nicole was just saying, like that has been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, like the wayfinding signage and getting rooms numbered. So there was a lot of numbering across the library, but it was like the old painted numbers on the wall that you know were painted in like the 60s and had you know long since started to rub off and everything and you know here comes JJ all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and I'm like this isn't okay nobody can find anything um and if you have a disability like this is horrible we need to make a change and basically I um emailed the head of facilities like once a month for two years until we got wayfinding signage and and the rooms were numbered and I found out later that basically I pissed off a lot of people because the wayfinding and the signage um all of that had gone through like three committees in 10 years and nothing had ever been done um and I, you know, here I come saying things like, this is not okay. Um, you know, I'm glad you all met about it for 10 years, but you have to do something about it. Um, so this work can be kind of fraught with danger mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, damaging your reputation um, in, you know, getting that reputation of, oh, hey, it's me again. <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm glad you want to do this thing, but it's not accessible. Um, some for some people, that's uh, that gives that's given me a good reputation. For some people, they hate my guts. <laughs> All right. Um, Dr. Thompson wanted to know if you had a list of the references you noted in your presentation. Um, I pushed her your Google Scholar profile. Are there other uh, citations uh, that we can get to the audience or post on the course website? 
Um, there are some citations on the um, first couple of slides. Um, okay, and we'll have this, those up. Yeah, yeah, of this presentation. The Library um, Accessibility Alliance is actually working on a sort of introduction to library accessibility Google Doc, um, and I'm currently working on populating that, but it's not ready yet. Okay. Um, when it is, I'll send you an email. Excellent, uh, thank you. But I don't have anything like at hand. I should, but I don't have anything at hand right now. So sorry about that. No worries. Uh, and while we're talking about references, I'm just putting this in the chat box. This is a link uh, to JJ's LibGuide on disability theory. Um, lots of excellent information and links there that people uh, should be aware of. All right, um, Dylan wants to know, how often will someone explain their disability or have their disability observed in a library setting? Totally depends on the disability. Um, so like I have a mental health disability, I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, but I also walk with a cane. Um, so the cane part is completely obvious, um, but the complex post-traumatic stress disorder is not, um, unless you're really paying attention to how I interact with people, how I move, how I move in the room around other people and things like that. Um, so I think, you know, more often than not, you probably do observe people with disabilities in libraries all the time, but you probably don't see them um, because you're not looking for it. Um, and especially hidden disabilities are very, very subtle. Um, it could be not making eye contact. It could be that patron always sits with their back to a wall so they can see a door, um, you know, things like that. Uh, it just really depends on the person. All right, other questions? So JJ, can you see Kim's question? Uh, yeah. Kim visited a library or museum um, that said they were not allowed to add informative signage because of a clause in the contract with the architect who designed mm -hmm. the space. The architect insisted signage would take away from the aesthetics of the space. Just a case to highlight your point that signage battles can be larger than just sticking up a good sign. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, and they can definitely be larger. I mean, I did a accessibility walkthrough of Eastern Illinois University's library, Booth Library, a couple of years ago. And like the first thing I told the person I was walking with, I was like, there's no signage. I have no idea where the bathroom is. I have no idea where the reference desk is. I don't know where I am. Um, and she was like, yeah, our library director is anti-signage and we're just waiting for him to retire. Um, and he did, and now there's signage. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes signage can be super political. Sometimes it can be contractual, like your example. Um, like, you know, and architects, you know, and donors can be weird. The uh, engineering, Granger Engineering Library here at UIUC, the donor mandated that the stairwells the, the handrails and all the stairwells be painted yellow. They always have to be painted yellow. Like, why? What's the point? <laughs> but okay. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I mean, yellow doesn't get in the way of good accessibility, but in the case of the museum, like, man, is that a not okay? You know, talk about bad design. Good example. Other questions or comments? So Nicole put up the, uh, the disability theory guide. The uh, disability guides were actually from a ALA Carnegie Whitney grant, uh, which allowed me to purchase a graduate student, <laughs> hire a grad student um, to help me with the work. And the disability live guides, there's I think about 25 now, somewhere around there. Um, are notable because we did try to make them as accessible as we could. So they aren't, um, they're deliberately not comprehensive. Um, you know, we stick to like three to five um, resources per, per area so that we're not overwhelming people with information because of course as librarians, we love to do that. 
Um, so um, Jaina, her name was Jaina Manson. She and I actually wrote an article about making the libguides accessible and, and the problems we ran into. There are parts of libguides that are not accessible and you have no control over them because it's a spring share issue. Um, and that article came out in 2017 uh, in Journal of Web Librarianship. Um, so there's one out there as well. Um, uh, can or how often are ADA lawsuits used to compel orgs to make accommodations? More often than you think. Good question, Benjamin. I mean, it's actually quite often. So when we think about Payon versus the Los Angeles Community College District, LACCD, um, you know, that that particular lawsuit um, is kind of earth shattering because it says, no, you cannot remediate and get this back to somebody later. So like right now, almost every university that I know of, I mean, not almost every university that I know of, uh, a student with a sight disability will say, hey, I need this book converted um, to a digital document, to a PDF, so I can read it on my screen reader. And then the library or disability services says, okay. And it may take a week, two weeks, three weeks to convert the book, depending on the workload. Um, Payon versus LACCD states that, no, that book has to be available immediately. Like that person has to be able to access that book in a digital format that they can read with their screen reader at the same time as a sighted person can go to a shelf and pick it up off the shelf. Um, so, I mean, that lawsuit and the judgment, more specifically the judgment, represents a, a relatively huge shift in the courts. Now I have, um, of course, I have no doubt that LACCD is fighting it, um, but right now it's gonna stand. So um, just give Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. So JJ Benjamin Benjamin wanted to know are there particular organizations that have been proactive in making accommodations or engaging this in interesting or unique ways? Um are there organizations that are doing work? There are always organizations doing work. Unfortunately, most of the ones that I know of are really focused on um, like individual pieces. So um, improving accessibility for people in wheelchairs, improving accessibility um, for people with autism. So it's very much more specific um, rather than focusing more on like general accessibility, if that makes sense. And it's a lot of micro organizations. Um, a lot of them, you know, working in the local area, so to speak. All right, thank you. Okay, any remaining questions or comments?
So JJ, before I um, adjourn everything, can you just give a little tiny plug uh, for mental health first aid? Oh yeah, of course. Um, so mental health first aid is fabulous. It is basically a nationwide organization that does training around mental health and very specifically um, like a mental health intervention. So if somebody's having a, a mental health crisis, it gives you the tools to navigate that crisis as an outsider, right? So that the person having the crisis is safe and that you are safe as well. Um, it also educates you about various different conditions, mental health conditions. You Now, when I did the training a couple of years ago, it was 20 bucks, which was usually, which I think was really like the cost of the book and, and the pizza that we had for lunch. <laughs> it's eight hours, it's an eight hour training, so it's all day, um, but it is nationwide. So usually the closest place um, for me here in Champaign-Urbana is Chicagoland. Um, but considering that you're in a larger city, um, there probably is one nearby that does it. Um, it's well worth it because it focuses specifically on mental health. Um, the other training program that's really, really good is Project Enable. Um, Project Enable is through Syracuse. It's free. It is specifically aimed at librarians. It's really great for, um, I don't know anything about disability or what the law says, and I need to know more about this topic. Um, and so it's free um, and it's a really great training, um, you know, learn at your own pace kind of thing. Um, and it's been around for a couple of years. It's not so heavy on um, sort of compassion and empathy, which is why I wanna develop a training around that. But in terms of like the nuts and bolts, this is what disability is, this is what the law says, um, these are the different disabilities you might encounter. Project Enable is really wonderful. All right, perfect, thank you. So we have the links to Project Enable and also the mental health first aid uh, in the chat box. So with that, um, I'm going to bring us to a close. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking JJ for spending some time with us today uh, and sharing some really important information and great expertise. JJ is uh, absolutely one of the uh, authorities in this dimension of the field in this part of diversity work. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, if you guys have follow-up questions, please email me. Um, I would love to hear from you and um, have a wonderful day. Hopefully without, you know, lots of thunder and, and lightning and everything. <laughs> so we will do our best. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you uh, to everyone in the class. Uh, we will meet again next week. And for our guests, very happy to have you. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yes, Molly, happy birthday to JJ. Thank you for joining us on your birthday. Thank you. Um, it's been fun. So that's, that's, this is one of my fun things that I do. So I was like, I want to do this for my birthday. <laughs> um, so yeah. All right. Thank you. And everyone, uh, have a good evening, have a good week, and we will meet again soon. I have spoken. <laughs> exactly. So have a good week. Thank you for having me. Good night. <laughs>